following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. D. Valkyrie, Act 1. As a fierce storm is raging, Sigmund seeks refuge in a house built around the trunk of a mighty ash tree. Sigmund is greeted by Seglinde, Hundig's unhappy wife. Sigmund tells her that he is fleeing from enemies. After taking a drink of mead, he moves to leave, claiming to be cursed by misfortune. However, Seglinde bids him to stay, saying that he can bring no misfortune to the house where ill luck lives. Returning, Hundig reluctantly offers Sigmund the hospitality demanded by custom. Seglinde, who is increasingly fascinated with the visitor, urges him to tell his tale. Sigmund describes returning home with his father one day, only to find his mother dead and his twin sister abducted. He then wandered around with his father until parted from him as well. One day he found a girl being forced into marriage and fought with the girl's relatives. However, his weapons were broken and the bride was killed, and he was forced to flee to Hundig's home. Initially, Sigmund does not reveal his name choosing only to call himself Woeful. When Sigmund finishes, Hundig reveals that he is one of Sigmund's pursuers. He grants Sigmund a night's stay, but they are to do battle in the morning. Hundig leaves the room with Seglinde, ignoring his wife's distress. Sigmund laments his misfortune, recalling his father's promise that he would find a sword in direst need. Seglinde returns, having drugged Hundig's drink to send him into a deep sleep. She reveals that she was forced into a marriage with Hundig. During their wedding feast, an old man had appeared and plunged a sword into the trunk of the ash tree in the center of the room, which Hundig and his, and his companions had all failed to remove. She expresses her longing for the hero who could draw the sword and save her. He expresses his love for her, which she reciprocates, and she begins to grope for where she recognizes him from, and then finally realizes she recalls his voice and that they resemble each other. When she learns from him the name of his father, Walse. She tells him that his name is Sigmund, and that the wanderer left the sword for him. Sigmund now easily draws the sword forth, and she tells him her own name, Seglinde, and that they are siblings. He gives the blade the name Nothing, which evokes the dire need for a weapon against Hundig. He and Seglinde flee together from Hundig's house. Since the times of yore, 
the masters had been working very hard with the Valkyries in order to help this humanity. We had to understand <coughs> that the monad, the master itself, which never falls, is always the junction of the spirit with the spiritual soul. When the spiritual soul and the spirit unites, then the master is born. So, in this part of uh, Wagner's opera, the Valkyrie, is hidden a marvelous doctrine of alchemy, which is always shown to the different myths in even religions. The Nordics are precisely the descendants from the Hyperboreans and the Hyperboreans are the manifestation of an ancient past which in esotericism is called the Mahamambantara of the sun or the sun, the solar, solar round. Any planet itself passes always through different stages which are called rounds. And it is necessary to understand and comprehend these rounds in order to follow the sequence of Wagner's opera. All the Wagner's works are really profound. A great master that left for us this beautiful an amazing work in which we find a very profound esotericism. Only someone with such a sight could write such a music and go deep into the past in order to leave that concentrated in this one wonderful piece of music, opera. So, every planet has to pass through seven rounds. Each round is called a small maha, or might it better to say a small mambantara. In Mambantara means cosmic day. The addition of all the seven Mambantaras is called a Maha Mambantara. A great cosmic day. <coughs> so our planet Earth is the outcome of three previous Mambantaras. We are in the fourth Mambantara, called the Mambantara of the Earth, of this present cosmic day in which we are right now, terrestrial, terrestrial round. In Nordic mythology, as in any myth, you always find a symbol in a tree. Many times we talk about the tree of life, Kabbalah, and of course, 
the Nordics shouldn't miss that tree, which is called the Yggdrasil tree. That you can see there in the website, which is a tree divided in three parts. The roots, the middle, which is the, the trunk, and the branches. The branches are called Asgard, the home of the Aces, the gods. The middle part is called Midgard, the place where the human beings lived, and the roots, of course, you find Nibelheim, the abode of the lost ones. A synthesis of the whole work of the tree of life. If you observe the tree of life of the Hebrew mythology, you find that it has nine spheres above Malkut and it has nine spheres below Malkut. In esotericism, we call the world of Malkut, the earth, Mesocosmos, which is, translation is, the cosmos of the middle. And obviously, Midgard, of uh, the Yggdrasil tree, is precisely pointing us to Malkut, the abode of the human beings, where the gods made the great experiment. Every time that Midgar appears, that the planet appears, is precisely the outcome of Asgard and Nibelheim. Because every planet is the outcome of karma. It is written that karma is the cause of existence. And of course, the gods above in Asgard also have karma, which is called katantia. And the karma of below is the karma of the demons, the Nibelheim, the lost ones. And the conjunction of both, katantia and karma, creates in every cosmic day. So we will say that we, the terrestrial round, the fourth circle in the center of the Yggdrasil is the outcome of three previous manifestations. These gods, masters, self-realized beings that in the three previous manifestations achieve happiness, mastery, knowledge, assist us, come from above in order to help this terrestrial round, and that's precisely what is pointing here in the Valkyria and in all the opera. Because we have to comprehend and understand that Midgard, this terrestrial round, which is called the Aryan root race, or better say, the terrestrial run in, in this uh, root race where we are living, which is the fifth root race, is the outcome of the previous manifestations of forces, which is very clear, esoterically speaking, shown in the opera. As you recall, the beginning of that opera, everything starts when Sigmund enters into that house within which the trunk 
of the ash tree is precisely in the middle. And if you observe the Yggdrasil, you will see how that trunk of that, uh, that tree is precisely in the middle of uh, Midgard. So, the opera, Wagner, is showing us that everything that is happening in this first part of the Valkyria is happening in Midgard. This Midgard is the whole planet Earth, is any country, any house, and even your physical body. If you use that symbology, you will understand that that trunk then, if it is, it is Midgard is your physical body, obviously that trunk is your spinal column. And this is how myth is always hidden. Macrocosm and microcosm. The rune Sig, called also Sigalus, reminds us of Sigmund and Singled. Sig is a hieroglyphic of the sun. As you in. So I believe related with that rune Sikh, which precisely has the shape of a lightning, a ray that descends from above. It's precisely that victorious ray that is in the hands of Jupiter, the father of all gods, Christ, Odin. Or in this case, Wotan. But behold here, the deep meaning and the source of that wisdom of the Nordics. In the solar epoch, in the second round of uh, these seven rounds that eventually the earth has to pass through, in the second round, the solar round, there was a great initiate that reached the summit of perfection. And uh, who in this time, humanity knows him as the Christ. And it is because in this round, in this terrestrial round, he uh, lived physically all the drama of the Christ, which is not a person, but an energy, a force, a cosmic energy. So Jesus of Nazareth, the master of Aramento, was and is the highest initiate of the solar epoch, of the second cosmic day of this terrestrial, or, or this uh, Mahamambantara. So at that time, of course, there were many great initiates. The Master Samael on the or also self realized himself for the first time at that time. And all the archangels that we find in this day and age are the outcome of that cosmic day. After that cosmic day finishes, or finished, another cosmic day started, which was the past cosmic day, previous to our terrestrial round. And that cosmic day is called the lunar round. And at that epoch, Jehovah was the greatest, greatest for the highest initiate. This is very important to understand because Master Jesus is previous, a master that is back into time than Jehovah. But both of them, of course, are great 
Nietzsche's cosmic masters. One is the outcome of the solar epoch, and Jehovah, the outcome of the lunar epoch. Everything in nature repeats, as you know, or recapitulates. And that's why in the first part of the opera, that was spoken by a previous speaker, he describes how the cosmic day of the Mahamadara started. And now here we are arriving <coughs> at the mid Midgard, which is precisely the beginning of the Valkyria. But the terrestrial source or the terrestrial offspring that appears in Midgard is the outcome of a plan of the gods, as you already realized. These gods are the beings for previous cosmic days that self-realize themselves, monad with mastery. So, before the entrance into this root race that we call the Aryan race, which is precisely rooted in the Nordics, in the Hyperboreans. Before this root race existed the Atlantean root race, which the speaker in the previous lecture was describing the symbology of. So, the Atlantean civilization had seven sub-races. And the fourth sub-race of the Atlantean civilization was mixed by the plan of the gods with the Hyperboreans. Because the Hyperboreans were precisely those beings, children of fire, or we'll say the children of the mist of fire, which were mixed with the fourth sub-race of the Atlantean civilization in order to form the nucleus for this present Aryan race. That is precisely the root of our present Aryan race. The Bible called this mixture the Shemites. The authentic, legitimate Shemites are the outcome of the mixture of Hyperboreans, which were the second root race that existed around the North Pole. Around the North Pole were the land of Avalon. Lands which are situated in the fourth dimension. The Hyperboreans were beings that were worshippers of the sun because they were the recapitulation of the second round in this present terrestrial round of manifestation. And that's why Nietzsche and many other great German writers always point to the Hyperboreans as the root of the Aryan race. Because indeed, in that mixture in the Atlantean civilization, the Aryan, the root of the Aryan race was forming. And uh, at that time, they spoke a language which many, in many times in the, in the lecture we always say, is the Watang, a, le uh, a language spoken by the Atlanteans. So Watang is the root of Hebrew, Sanskrit, and Chinese. And from them, of course, come other languages. In the first root race, this great uh, archangel Uriel which was precisely a child of the second round, the solar round, where Jesus was the highest initiate, 
He was also incarnated in the first root race, which was called the polar race. That polar race that was located in the fourth dimension, in which is now the North Pole. Uriel wrote a book with runic characters. It was known and studied in the Hyperborean epoch. So this runic alphabet comes from the very beginning of the creation of this world. And from the runic alphabet derived the Hebrew alphabet and many other alphabets in the world. So, Watan was the language that the primeval uh, Hyperboreans mixed with the Atlanteans spoke. And from that language come the word Watan. Watan. A language related with wisdom. Related with fire. Related with the mystery of the fire. The solar light. They, the Hyperboreans, this is written, if you read in uh, Greek mythology, were worshippers of Apollo. Apollo in Dodon, or Dodona, is of course the god of the sun. So here you find the relationship of Apollo and the Hyperboreans, the solar epoch, and the highest initiate of that epoch, the master of Eramento, Jesus Christ, in this day and age. So the plan among the Hyperboreans, solar beings of that epoch, was to bring to humanity salvation. <coughs> because they knew at that time that in the epoch of this fifth sun, which is the Aryan race, the gods will die. They knew already that Valhalla, the great hall of the warriors, was becoming separated from Midgard, and only the courageous men can win. Those ones that were searching for the knowledge were entering into that Valhalla, into the hall of the warriors. So there was, of course, a separation. The gods were diminishing. The gods were in danger to disappear. Not in the sense to disappear like into nothing, but in the sense of that humanity will stop the worshipping of the solar gods, as it is written in the great Aztec calendar, the Nahual, they say that the children, the children of the fifth son, we, the Aryans, in this epoch, the worshipping of the gods will die. This prophecy is already fulfilled. Because this humanity mocked the gods. The gods exist. Humanity cannot see the gods. Because a big wall, Valhalla, Valhalla is there. And only the courageous one can pass through. But that was, of course, a great plan of the gods in order to bring into this civilization, into this Aryan root race, a hope in order to help this humanity. Because the karma of the gods 
And the karma of this planet is very heavy. So we hold here how the rune Sikh or Sigwellus is descending from heaven by the ray of creation. The sun, the solar force, Sikh. From that root, of course, of Sikh comes Sigmund or Sigmund, Singlid, which is, of course, the force of the God descending into Midgard in order to help humanity. Here, in this marvelous symbology, we see, of course, in the physical organism of the human being, the symbology of the two witnesses which are better explained in the Mayan Bible called Popol Bu. Hunapu Erix Balanque, which according to this Mayan Bible it states that when they die, one become the moon, became the moon, and the other the sun. And here have the other we have here the other symbology with Sigmund and Singlid. The two polarities, the outcome, the spring, the offspring of Watan, the word that descends. They descend, they are created by Odin Watan with the objective of uh, the creation of the solar man, harvesting of solar man. That's why you, well, you have to see there, these siblings, these twins, are the symbol of the two forces, solar and lunar, in which the gods are working through. But they are, of course, in Midgard, which is the, the, the will of Samsara. Malkut. Or as the Bible called, Egypt. Because Egypt is Malkut, the kingdom, Midgard, where all of us are here in slavery. But the inner father, the gods above, they are preoccupied with us. And they are trying to induce us to go out of those mechanical laws of Midgard, ruled by the mechanicity of nature, represented in mythology in that opera of the Nords with Frika, the wife of Watson. So Frika, the, the wife of Watan, <coughs> is of course the representation of the laws of nature in which we are submitted mechanically in that the law of nature implies that we have to obey the rules to follow the laws of this mechanicity of the planet. And that's why you see there Hunding, which is the wife of Eve, Singlid. It is necessary to remind you that because of the fall, because of fornication, because the because of in ignorance, Eve eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and gives that to Adam. If now you understand that Adam is the brain and Eve represents the sexual organs, you will understand how Eve eats of the fruits and gives to the brain the outcome of it, which is Adam. 
In this case, this Adam is Sigmund, and that Eve is Singlid. The two polarities. But because of their ignorance, because of the thirst for knowledge, Singlid is married to Hundin, which is a dog. It's a little dog. In German, as I know, Hund. I, be, I guess this is the pronunciation. It's a dog. Hunding. A dog there that is thirsty of sex. Lust. The mechanicity of nature. And of course, this Hundin has a tribe. That tribe of Hundin, which is always defending, and that Sigmund tries to defeat, because he's, they are always uh, unjust. The other names are lust, anger, pride, vanity, laziness, gluttony, envy, arrogance. All of those psychological aggregates of course, friends and relatives of Hunding, which work in the laws of nature, and there are children of nature, cowards that are being, that are the outcome of fornication, is the outcome of not knowing how to handle the goal of the Rhine goal. The goal of the river, Rhin. Which is a sexual force, as you know already. And Eve, Singlet, is married to Hundin. Unwillingly. But it is because she ate of the fruit and because the thirst for knowledge. Because if you remember in the Bible, when Adam and Eve are before the tree of knowledge, then the Loge appears, appears there and says, if you eat from that fruit, your, your eyes will be open. But there are two ways of eating it. Through alchemy, or ingesting that force, in order to create something spiritual within, or a fornication, that you create hunding, uh, egotistical nature within you. And this is how it's written in Kabbalah that Eve Mary uh, Nahema and Adam marries Lilith. There's two polarities or egotistical natures. That in this case, Sigmund is married to a woman that is not in love, and singlet with a man that is not in love too. But somehow, they have to be united. We will say, esoterically, they have to commit incest. They had to break the law or the mechanicity of nature in order to bring out their salvation. And this is why you see there that is an apparent adultery, an apparent incest, within which is hidden the alchemy in which the initiate always confronts when you enter into the path in Midgard, you know that your being manifests through the ash tree, to the Yggdrasil, your spinal column. But you are blind. You are looking. You are searching for knowledge. And in that search, you commit many mistakes. But of course, those that are against that searching for knowledge from the wisdom of God are always 
those people from Midgard, which followed the mechanicity of the laws of Frika, the mechanicity of the laws of the will of Samsara, which are related with the lunar forces. To break that is to fight against your own blood, your own flesh. And that's why the Lord, the Christ said, whosoever is not capable of abandoning father, mother, sister, brother, is not willing to follow me, is not capable or is not worthy to follow me. What is that? It doesn't mean that you have to hate your family in this physical world. No. It means that you have to hate the roots that you have within. You can be with your family. But the roots here, father and mother, that the Lord is explaining, is related with the ego that we have within. Our mother is lust. Hund. A dog. So we have to go far away from hunting. And that's precisely pointing the sexual force. The sexual force is feminine. It's singling. And Sigmund is the brain that searches for knowledge. The union of both brain and sex give the outcome of the entrance into the initiation to the ninth sphere. And this is precisely the point here. Searching for knowledge, hunting, or in this way, excuse me, Sigmund, is trying to find knowledge, the doctrine, the way <coughs> to enter into the higher realms of life. But it's not until the moment when he enters and meets his sister, when he finds the way. Because his father, his inner being, has promised him, I will give you the weapons, the necessary weapons to fight against those enemies that you have within, those unbelievers that mock me, that are within you. Any place that you go and try to save your own soul, they always appear and steal the innocence of your soul. But you need to awake that force. You will know the moment. And when you find that moment, you will receive a sword, a weapon, to fight against your enemies, your unbelievers, those uncircumcised, or in other words, those fornicators that do not transmute the energy. Because you are now single. But you need more strength. And of course, Watan, the word, the wise, knows very well that all these singlet, the sexual force, can give the, uh, that weapon to Sigmund. And that's why they recognize each other. So when you recognize, when you unite the two forces, Ida and Pingala, without the union of those two forces, the sword cannot appear. And where else that sword is but in the trunk, in the spinal column? There is where Watan, Odin, inserted the weapon. But you have to awake it. You had to win that by knowing how to transmute the solar and lunar atoms of your own organism. And for that, you have to be courageous. You need telema, willpower, that courageousness that Sigmund is showing. It's a searcher. It's a searcher of knowledge. And his sister is also a searcher. But it's bound to the laws of nature, unfortunately. 
The brain, always free, looks for the way to be free from this mechanicity of nature. But he doesn't know, the brain doesn't know, that singly the sexual force is the one that, it, that binds him and her to the laws of Frika. And this is all the only way is by uniting solar and, and, and lunar atoms in order to awake and attain the sword. This is how in the opera that I always see, Sigmund goes and plays his back against the tree. I don't know if there's other versions, but the way in which should be is there. Sigmund places the back against the ash tree and above his head is the sword that Odin, Wotan, inserted in the ash tree. And by singing, by singing, of course, by pronouncing the necessary mantras in the sexual union with his sister, which means when the solar and lunar atoms are united there, which are the outcome of the above, because those forces come from above, from Keter, descending into, according to the ray of creation, into the ninth sphere. When they transmute that by singing, by pronouncing the necessary mantra that we already know, and then the brain, Sigmund, receives the sword. Thanks to singlet. And that's the Newton that comes from nothing. Comes in the, in, the, in the very moment when they need it. And that's the sword that he needs in order to fight. And of course, <coughs> in that sword of Watan that is awakening which is the same Kundalini, and that is rising from the sexual organs, in other words, from Eve to the brain to Adam. So this is how the sword comes, from singlet to Sigmund, from the moon to the sun, as aligning the rune sikh. That's the sword. And with that sword, we are willing to fight our enemies, which are within us. Hundin. But it's asleep. Because during, the, during transmutation, Eve takes the energy. You see, the sexual organs, when we fornicate, takes the energies from the father in order to, to feed Hundin. But when we transmute the energy, singlet doesn't feed any more Hundin. So therefore, Hundin falls into a deep sleep and gives the energy to, his, to her brother, who is Sigmund, in order to fight that individual that is within and that is against the laws of God and that only follows the mechanicity of Frika, the will of Samsara. Of course, this, which we are explaining here, it's in symbology. It's not easy. You have to do it. It's how you see it. And it's explained there in Midgard. Because it says where is or the Garden of Eden. In the middle. It's where Adam and Eve are. The same symbology. The same myth. The two polarities that we need to work with. And from, where, from which, in this way, as, as Wagner is showing it in the opera, will come something spiritual. The offspring, the offspring of that union will be Siegfried, the victorious one. So, they enter into love, they love each other, 
And uh, you remind that, remember that the end of that part is by uh, the spring, the forces spring open into that house because they are working with the forces of spring, with the forces of nature in the positive way. They have already the sword. They are already ready to conquer and to go uh, in their self-realization, the self-realization of the being. Act 2. Wotan is standing on a rocky mountainside with Brunhilde, his Valkyrie daughter. He instructs Brunhilde to protect Sigmund in his upcoming fight with Hundig. Fricka, Wotan's wife and the guardian of wedlock, arrives demanding punishment against Sigmund and Siglinde, who have committed adultery and incest. She knows that Wotan, disguised as the mortal man False, had fathered Sigmund and Seglinde. Wotan protests that he requires a free hero, one that is not connected to him, to aid in his plans. But Fricka retorts that Sigmund is not a free hero, but an unwitting pawn of Wotan. Backed into a, co into a corner, Wotan promises Fricka that Sigmund will die. Fricka leaves, leaving Brunhilde with the despairing Wotan. Wotan explains his problems. Troubled by the warning deliver, delivered by Erda at the end of Das Rheingold, he had seduced the earth goddess to learn more of the prophesied doom. Brunhilde was born to him by Erda. He had raised Brunhilde and eight other daughters as the Valkyries warrior maidens who gathered the souls of fallen heroes to form an army against Albrecht. Valhalla's army will fail if Albrecht gets control of the ring, which is in Fafner's possession. Using the Tarnhelm, the giant has transformed himself into a dragon lurking in a forest with the Nibelung treasure. Wotan cannot obtain the ring from Fafner, who is bound to him by contract. He needs a free hero to defeat Fafner in his stead. However, as Fricka pointed out, he can only create thralls, serfs, bondsmen, slaves to himself. Bitterly, Wotan orders Brunhilde to obey Fricka and ensure the death of his beloved child Sigmund. Sigmund and Siglinde enter the mountain pass, where Seglinde faints in guilt and exhaustion. Brunhilde approaches Sigmund, telling him of his impending death. Sigmund refuses to follow Brunhilde to Valhalla when he finds out that Seglinde cannot go as well. Impressed by his courage, Brunhilde relents and agrees to protect Sigmund instead. Hundig arrives and attacks Sigmund, Blessed by Brunhilde, Sigmund begins to overpower Hundig, but Wotan appears and shatters Nothung, Sigmund's sword, with his spear. Disarmed, Sigmund is slain by Hundig. Brunhilde seizes Siglinde and the shards of Nothung and flees on horseback. Wotan looks down on Sigmund's body, grieving. He kills Hundig with a contemptuous gesture and sets out in pursuit of Brunhilde. To reach the mountain of initiation, to reach mastery is not enough in order to attain liberation. The two couples, or the two couple, excuse me, the couple, with the two people, Sigmund and Singlid, go out, of course, and start working in themselves and finally reaching the summit of that mountain where Wotan and the Valkyria is, which means, of course, the spirit and the spiritual soul. It's a development, of course, here of the initiation 
With initial has to go through alchemy, as we already explained. But the plan of the gods is not just to create Hannah's Musen. He wants, they want to create a hero capable of taking over the gods. In other words, another god. Sigmund is doing it, but it's not enough. He has to confront Hundin and the egos. And Hundin, the ego, and his tribe is related with karma. Karma is causing effect in Frika, the laws of nature, are not going to give away so easily the initiative. Frika, nature, always works with his, her weapons and wants to, to stop the daring that wants to conquer her. It is very easy to see there how Frika appears and is blaming Watton that that couple that is transmuting the energy and arising and, be, uh, and going against her, against her own loss. And that's precisely what happened in the life of any initiate. When we enter into this, we are against the loss, the mechanicity of the loss of our own body, our own family, our own nation. That's why the life of any initiate is always surrounded by revolution. People that protest, that don't want, because the forces of nature, the laws of nature work, work. To that, to the last. You shall not do this. You shall not do that. You have to follow the mechanicity of the lunar path. All religions. Rooted in family. Rooted in the blood. And lunar religions. But only the solar religion. Are the one that conquers family. And they go beyond that. And find that the true family is universe. But there are many people that feel themselves so attached to their roots, to their blood, to their race. And they cannot become victorious. And precisely that is that Hundin doesn't want to give away so easily Eve, Singlid, and go after her. And of course... This karma involved in it, as you see. And in that karma, of course, is coming from past cosmic days. The Nibelungen outbreak, which is already the head of the Nibelungen, is planning how to take humanity in his hand. He wants the power. Because the Nibelungen, the beings that dwell in Klipoth, the Baalim, Javeh and his followers, utilizes the ego in order to manipulate humanity. And that is precisely what Watton is afraid of. Because he already sees that the black magicians are already planning and conquering and going into humanity. They then want to help humanity. But a great sacrifice has to happen. A dissension has to come. As you know, there is always the Savior in this uh, uh, task or in this plan. <coughs> doesn't matter how we work by ourselves, but there is a point in which we need the Savior. We need a sacrifice of the God, somebody that will sacrifice and descend into the realm of Midgard and abandon his powers. And that, of course, is in relation with our own particular ray with our own particular God. 
and the logos above. This is what is hidden there, in which the mechanical laws of nature somehow have to be conquered, but in a very wise way, with a free will. And that's precisely what is hidden there in the will of Watton. He wants to create that hero. But that hero is always assisted by the inner being. He wants a different hero that will have a free will and that will give that free will to him without asking. Of course, in the great drama in the Bible, we find that a hero, which is called Jesus, who says, Father, if it's possible, take this chalice out of me, but not my will, but thine be done. It's a free will. And for that, of course, part of the monad <coughs> had to descend into the drama which we are seeing here. And uh, Sigmund has to die. Which is that part of the soul that represents at, that, at this uh, height, at this level right now, the terrestrial man. Because first, the terrestrial man has to be created. As we explained in many lectures before, this humanity is just made by hundings, which are utilizing their sexual force singly in their own way, and who are creating cowards, weak individuals, slaves of the forces of Frika, nature. Only those Only those crashes when that are capable to fight against their own desires, their own lust, their own dog, hund, are capable of reaching the level of the terrestrial man or the level of human being. Because a human being has to be created. And in order for, create, for the human being to be created, we need to create within, as you know, astral body, mental body, causal body, in order to reach the summit of that mountain. But those two forces, Idap and Gala, are the ones that rise there, because from them, from that union of male-female, sun and moon, comes the human being. But remember that that human being has to prepare himself, has to die. It's coming into my mind the decapitation of John the Baptist. John the Baptist has to die in order for the Messiah, the Savior, the victorious one to appear. And this is something very beautiful. Because Sigmund, the human soul, bottle up within Hundin, which is working, is mingled with it. And that's the terrestrial man that has to die. And that's precisely the great, the great step that few initiates can do. Many initiates that enter into the path, they get their sword, they reach the mastery, but they don't go beyond. They continue with their hunden within themselves. Ignoring that that hunding, that ego, 
that tribe, that legion of defects, psychological aggregates that we have within, are moved easily by the laws of nature and by Albrecht, the Baalim, the black magicians from Nibelheim, who only like gold and power and who do not care a bit by the laws of God because they are fornicators and they awake the energy in the negative way. They utilize the goal of the rind in the wrong way in order to build that ring, which symbolizes, of course, the power of the kunda buffer organ. In order for you to develop the kunda buffer organ, which is the opposite of the kundalini, you need to hate love. There is a being that hates love. The sun is love. The Father is wisdom, the Son is love, and the Holy Spirit is sexual force. Christ, the Son, is love. And there is a being that hates the Christ badly, and is the boss of the Black Lodge, and his name is Jave. Jave, the boss of the Black Lodge, hates the Christ. He renounces love. And he has the power. He has the ring. And the gods know that. But of course, Javé works with the mechanicity of the force of nature. It's represented in this case by the Nibelungen. Or by the Nibelung Albrecht. Who works in evil and for evil. Who collects gold and power. And that threatens the gods with their black latch. And who in this day and age have degenerated this humanity. This Aryan race. Who is the outcome of the Hyperboreans. The great sacrifice that was promised to this Aryan race. To this terrestrial epoch. Was accomplished 2000 years ago. That great initiate named Aberamento, the highest of the solar epoch, came to his hyperboreans through that blood. It is written, as you remember, that Jesus was the son of an Aryan soldier who impregnated the Jewish Miriam, the mother of Jesus of Nazareth, the mother of his physical body. So the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth is the outcome of hyperborean blood and Jewish blood. Hyperborean solar energy and lunar Jewish blood. That mixture was the plan in order to help this humanity which was falling into sin. The great master Abramento, Jesus of Nazareth, made the great sacrifice. That's why many great painters painted him with white skin. Many people don't like that. But the Hyperboreans are the root of the white race. And of course, all of us are Aryans. This is what we have to understand. This Aryan root race populates the entire earth. The first root race was or flourished in Tibet. The second in China and India. The third in Persia, Babylon. Egypt, the fourth among the Greeks and Romans, the fifth among the Germans, English, French, Teutons, and Anglo-Saxon, the sixth among the Latin American, 
the mixture of Europeans with natives of South America. And the seventh sub-race of the Arabian race is being formed here in the United States and Canada. The mixture of all races. So the whole planet Earth, the whole Midgard, is inhabited by the Arabian race, which unfortunately is being tricked by the Nivelungen, the Black Lodge. The Black Lodge fought against great being that came 2,000 years ago in order to deliver the solar force, the solar religion that has roots in previous cosmic days. Solar wisdom related with the development of solar men. But the lunar forces of Africa are very strong because this nature is heavy, charged it with a lot of karma of past cosmic days. And black magicians take advantage of that karma in order to sink humanity more into the mud. And unfortunately, Master Jesus was betrayed by the black lodge, or whatever we will say, by many initiatives that went into the black lodge following the Nibelungen. <coughs> Since that time, of course, that's why Christianity failed. It has only a few triumphs in the beginning, in the different epochs that some Sigmunds appeared in Zin. But most of Christian, Christianity in this day and age, as you know, only think that by believing in this great Hyperborean solar being called Jesus of Nazareth, they will be saved. Boreas is the god of the wind, or that part that the Greeks call in the north, the Boreas. The wind from the north. Hyperboreas is that area beyond the north, or the areas, the lands of the north. That's the meaning of the word Hyperborean. Beyond the north. And beyond the north, which is the North Pole, is of course the land of Avalon. The fourth dimension. Because if you see the planet Earth as Malkut, or if you see it as Midgard, understand that the south is the roots. The north are the branches. And then west and east in Midgard. So the north, of course, the branches of Asgard. The abode of the gods. But that Valhalla, that Thule, the sacred island of Avalon, the land of the Hyperboreans, is not in the third dimension. That Shangri-La is above above Midgard, and the first sephira that we find above Midgard is Yesod, the four dimension, the promised land, the land of Avalon, the Hyperborean land where all the masters dwell. And there is precisely the land of Apollo, ruled by the solar beings, there is precisely, at that time, in the Greek mythology, you find two great virgins that were coming from the Hyperborean, or from the fourth dimension, into Midgard, the third dimension. Hyperocha and Laodicea. Related, of course, symbolically with our own particular chakras, or churches, as the book of Revelation states, La Odisea in Agna Chakra, Philadelphia, the two churches above. From there, the wisdom, the knowledge of the Hyperboreans descend into the lower churches or chakras. 
That's the knowledge, that's the wisdom of the Hyperboreans. The Nordics come from the north, from Asgard. And that's the root of this myth. And of course, it's in Asgard where Wotan and Valkyria, Brunhilda, are talking about. This is also there when you find those gods that rule the laws of the will of Zamzara. Because they are angels. And those angels, what we call angels, are the beings that self-realize themselves in the lunar epoch. Because archangels are the beings that self-realize themselves before the lunar epoch, which is the solar epoch. So the angels related with the lunar epoch, which are commanded by Jehovah, are the ones that control the laws of nature. And of course, the gods are submitted to those laws. They don't break the laws. They have to know how to overcome those laws without hurting. Because they create karma if, if, if they do that in the wrong way. And that's the meaning of it. Of course, they're seeing there that this couple already reached the summit of the mountain. They're coming. But Hundin is after them. The karma, the ego. With, they don't want this mixture. There had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a decapitation. John the Baptist has to die. Because among all that are born from women, from Singlid, Singlid there is nobody highest than John the Baptist. But he who is the lowest in the kingdom of Asgard is higher than Sigmund, than John the Baptist. And it is written that he has to be decapitated in order for the Lord to come. But the Lord has to descend and to work. And that's precisely the great sacrifice that we see in that great drama where the spiritual soul and the spirit, Watan, in this case, the monad with the spiritual soul, the Valkyria, is trying to resolve how to help, how to go down and to do the work. But of course, in this uh, dissension, in this work, there's a great mystery that few people understand why Sigmund has to die and why Brunjilda disobey knowingly. He loves very much his inner father, his inner must. And she only performs the will of God. But in order to help, she needs to disobey, apparently, in such a way. In order to continue with the drama and to acquire perfection. In order for Siegfried to appear in the zine. So, the whole drama here is showing us how the gods also do work. We have to do our work here, assisted by our inner father. But there is a level in which they can assist us directly. Remember that the night muses, the night Valkyrie, are the representation of the night Sephiroth above the tree of life, the nine heavens. And uh, in every single heaven, the will of God is performed. But the first one that was born from Wotan was precisely Brunjilda, which is Brunhilda, which is in Yasad. That beautiful Cherub, or Cherub, as you want to call it. 
which is related with the sexual force. That's the first one that was born. And then the rest of the Valkyrie, which are nine. So the will of God is done above. And that reminds me that uh, saying of Jesus in the Mount of the Olives. Father, if it is willing, pass this cup out of me. But not my will, but thine be done. The whole segment has to die. With this, I had to, you had to comprehend that every single uh, initiate that represented the drama of Christ in the Bible, in the New Gospel, every single one was a Christ, was a self-realized master. But the highest among them was Master Averamento, that represented Christ. But John the Baptist was a Christ as well. And all the apostles were Christ, self-realized. This is how you have to understand. All the prophets of Jerusalem were Christ. Mohammed was Christ. Buddha was Christ. Because anyone that self-realized become a Christ and can represent any play of the drama in order to help humanity. So, of course, we have to work with the Enneagram. And that's precisely the point here. The Enneagram is not that work that people think that you buy the book, read it, and you start doing here without doing anything. No, the real Enneagram work starts when you reach the fifth initiation, the mastery, and if you take the direct path, which means that you have to die for Nirvana, from Asgard, in order to appear again doing the work from the very beginning in Midgard. Act 3. The other Valkyries assemble on the summit of a mountain, each with a dead hero in her saddlebag. They are astonished when Brunhilde arrives with a living woman, Seglinde. When they hear that she is fleeing Wotan's wrath, they are afraid to hide her. Seglinde is numb with despair until Brunhilde tells her that she is bearing Sigmund's child. Brunhilde decides to delay Wotan as Seglinde flees. Eager to be saved, she receives the pieces of the sword from Brunhilde and ecstatically thanks her rescuer as she rushes off into the forest to hide near Fafner's cave, a place safe from Wotan. When the god appears, he sentences Brunhilde to become a mortal woman, silencing her sister's objections by threatening to do the same to them. Left alone with her father, Brunhilde pleads that in disobeying his orders, she was really doing what he wished. Wotan will not relent. She must lie in sleep, booty for any man who finds her. But as his anger abates, she asks the favor of being surrounded in sleep by a wall of fire that only the bravest hero can pierce. Both sense this hero must be the child that Siglinde will bear. Sadly renouncing his, da- his daughter, Wotan kisses Brunhilde's eyes with sleep and mortality before summoning Loge, the spirit of fire, to encircle the rock. As flames spring up, the departing Wotan invokes a spell forbidding the rock to anyone who fears his spear. Wotan departs in sorrow. Loge, Lucifer, Mephistopheles, the fire is mingled everywhere. We find fire, Loge, in the water. We find fire, Loge, in the earth, in the wind. It's everywhere. Without Loge, without fire, nothing can exist. And he knows it. He is the child 
of the chaos. And he knows everything. But he acts accordingly. The level of being. According to the necessities. And that's why his actions. In hell and in heaven. Are misunderstood. By many. Watan cannot exist without Loge. Brongilda cannot exist without Loge. Sigmund and Singlet cannot do their alchemical work and cannot attain the sword without Loge. He's the one that orchestrates the whole opera in the hide, in the hidden. And of course, his Loge, Prometheus, his abode, his way of working through is in the night sphere. The Rhine goal, the goal of the Rhine is that Loge, that fire, which is heating the waters of the Asod. The power that is given into Brunjilda is that fire conquered by the gods and given unto her is coming from Loge. Without Loge, without temptation, there's no virtues. Temptation is fire. And the triumph over temptation is light, understanding, knowledge. Loge tempted Eve, tempted the couple in Midgard, and because of knowledge, they take the energy in the wrong way. But with experience and suffering and pain, they change. And they know that now they can steal the fire from Loge by not acting like animals. But also, that fire, that power, has to descend, <coughs> has to be a sacrifice. And this is precisely what Loge does, but Loge is not a sanctimonious being. Loge is beyond good and evil. Loge is like the cat that likes to play with the mouse when he's alive. And when he, that fire sees alive something, he starts playing. Because he wants to kill the mouse. And that mouse is hidden within the gods within the demons, within the men. And as long as this mouse is alive, Loge is active. When the mouse dies completely, Loge disappears. He says, my job is done. In this cosmic day, in this Mahabhambantara. And of course, the mixture, this is the secret of the Salvador Salvandus. And the only way to explain how that force can descend from above into the ninth sphere and to help us, how this being that loves really the will of God, represented in this opera by Brunjilda, which is the Valkyria of the truth, which, by the way, Val, as you know, means slaughter. A warrior. But now I want to give, because many people know already about the meaning of Kyrie or Kyrie in different ways in German language. But let me take the Greek language, which is also an Aryan language. Because in this day and age we speak many Aryan languages derived from the same root, which is Wotan, Watan, Odin the Hyperboreans of the Atlantean epoch. So, Kyrie in Greek means Lord. And Kyria, Lordess or Lady. It is a, a, a prayer that we said, Kyrie eleison, Lord of the highest. Hmm? So, in Greek, when you want to uh, respect an old woman, you call it Kyria. 
So, of course, that Kiria, that lady, that Lordess, is from above. We have our own particular inner Kiria. The Valkyria, which is a warrior. Spiritual soul above. And from that spiritual soul above, where the Christic mysteries are within the monad, a part of it descends, has to descend in order to sacrifice for that initiate. And that's precisely hidden in the following verse of Isaiah that our speaker will read right now. How art thou fallen from heaven, O shining star, sun of the dawning? How art thou cut down to Adama, the one who weakens on the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend up to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be Adama Elion, the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought out to Sheol, the abode of the dead, to the sides of the pit, Yesod, the ninth sphere. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. So you see that beautiful poem of Isaiah? The sides of the north, the clouds, which are precisely the horses where the Valkyrias ride in Asgard. The sides of the north. They will arise to the throne of heaven. But in this drama, in order for the being, in order for Adin and all the parts of the being to acquire self-realization, there had to be a sacrifice. And that is represented in that beautiful drama in which the father of the gods, Watan, Keter, represented in Chesed, is sacrificing part of him, which comes from above, which is the daughter of Erda, the divine mother, which is the ancient mother that had the wisdom of previous cosmic days, because from her comes all the wisdom. And Odin knows that. And from her, he gets Brunjilda and the eight other sisters that give him knowledge and wisdom in the universe. But if he wants to achieve what he is planning, to achieve another level of reasoning, higher, and to save the offspring of the gods, Lucifer has to descend. So Lucifer is not just, as people think, some individual up there in heaven that was against the will of God. And that's why God sent him down to suffer. Yeah, Lucifer suffers here in Midgard and in hell. But... With his disobeying, with the forces in, in this type of initiation, with his disobedience, he's performing the will of God. And this is something that you do not understand. Only if you watch the opera, you will see how they intuit that they have to do it. But they are chained to their own rules. And even the Valkyria, knowing that helping Sigmund is helping God. God interferes and breaks the sword of Sigmund because he knows that the drama has to continue. And his daughter, the spiritual soul, that is in this case already in Yesod. What do you mean is already in Yesod? Because the spiritual force, the monad, when somebody reaches mastery, <coughs> that force for a sacrifice has to descend into the ninth sphere as a cherub in order to work and continue the work of self-realization. 
And that's the myth of the Luciferian myth. That is related not only with one personage, but many parts of the being. That is what in esotericism, in Gnosticism, we call Christus Lucifer. Which is the sacrifice of Christ through the Valkyria, because within the divine soul, within the spiritual soul, are all the Christic powers. And through the divine soul is how the Lord descends, but has to do it through the Kerubi. That Kerubi, as you remember, in Yesod, the beings in Yesod are called Kerubim, which means the strong ones. It's in relation with the sexual force. It's in this way that the sacrifice, the divine force, has to become human. But in this case, it's beautiful. In that opera, it's better. Because you see the sacrifice of the feminine aspect. Many times we see in many myths the sacrifice of the masculine aspect, as a masculine force. But here we see it beautifully in a feminine aspect. In order to show, it's Wagner is showing here how that part of, of, of God that we have above loves God because he's feminine. He's a spiritual soul. But part of it has to descend and abandon God and that is the, the descension of Lucifer that Isaiah is chanting there, explaining in this case, to descend to the ninth sphere for the sake of God. They intuit, they know about it. But with the disobedience of the Valkyria, of course, God is forced to punish. In this case, we will say that that divine force mingle with the human level and acquire the things of the world. Do you realize this? The mixture of that, that when Christ descends into the initiate and mingle with the ego of the initiate in order to save him, he takes the sins of the world. Therefore, those that condemn Lucifer, that ignore about this, they don't know that that same Lucifer in the initiate is mingled with the ego of the initiate and is taking the guilt. And that is very also represented in Prometheus, in the myth of Prometheus in, the, in the Greek mythology. How the god of fire takes this, the fire of the sun. You see, the fire of the sun, the hyperborean, the solar light, and give it to the humans. Those humans are real sigmunds. Not the common, like the people think that Prometheus took the fire and then the primeval men started to make in weapons or using the fire in order to get warm. That's a very ridiculous explanation of a myth. The fire that Prometheus steals from the sun is a solar fire that is in the sex. And that only the courageous ones that know how to utilize that fire awake. And then Prometheus, because of that, is chained to the rock. The same rock which you see here, that the Valkyria is there. He's falling asleep. He's losing all his powers. That is precisely when you renounce Nirvana, when you renounce heaven, and then you enter into profound sleep you will start from the very, from scratch, from the very bottom. You already have what you had, but you lost all. Even Odin break the sword in defense. And that's why when Christ is born in defense in the, mingle, uh, in the manger of, 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 of the world, Herod, Hundin, Albrecht wants to kill that offspring, which is called Siegfried, that the next speaker will speak about. But here you see that the, the, the sacrifice. This is precisely here where you find Guinever, the great woman warrior, Valkyria, or the Amazon. You see, Valkyria. If you take the name Val as a warrior, and Kiria as lady from the highest, you find there a beautiful meaning. The lady warrior that descend and sacrifice, which is the divine soul, Budi, Geburah, 
because Gebura is a warrior in Kabbalah. It's represented by a warrior. But that is feminine. And descends into Yesod. And that's precisely the Kerubim. That when Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit, when they fornicate, that Kerubim is precisely that Gebura. Who is brandished now the sword. You lost the sword, that the sword I have it. And you cannot pass there to the tree of life. To the nine spheres. Hmm? That's precisely the same Kerube. But in this case, in the initiation, that Kerube is sacrificed. The beautiful Kerube goes down as Lucifer. Everyone has his own Lucifer. Mingle. Entwined. In the spinal column. Is the power of sex. Lucifer is lucky, lucky, that acts in different ways in order for you to conquer him. He enters sacrifice in order to fight against the dragon, the dragon of darkness, the giant, which is not related only with his ego, but also with the dark forces of nature, has the power of the Nibelungen, in that the Nibelungen want to steal. So this is how Brunhilda is on the rock of that mountain, surrounded by fire, which is Logge, Lucifer, because he's part of it. Only the courageous one, the one that conquers himself, is capable, capable of defeating that fire of Lucifer. That fire is temptation. And expresses itself through the spear, the point of the spear of Watan. That point of the spear, the symbol of the phallus. The spear that many initiates, even Hitler, were looking for. That spear of Longinus that hurt the side of the Lord. It is necessary to understand and to know that that spear is the phallus. And uh, the power is in the extreme, in the point of the spear. If the sexual force leaves that tip of the spear, the spear loses its power. But if nothing goes out of that tip of the sword, the spear has power. But lust mingles. In different levels, in the tree of life. And the angel has to work to conquer that. But for that, he needs the help of the Valkyria, which is related with the Katansia, the karma of the nine spheres above Malkut. Because Sigmund only can conquer the karma related with Malkut. But beyond that, is not related with him, is related with Valkyria, which is part of him, because he is his brother. As you see there in the in the opera, Sigmund, Singlid are siblings which are brother and sister of Valkyria, Brunjilda. But without uh, uh, I mean the different mother. Brunjilda is the daughter of Erda, which is the divine mother, something cosmic, superior. While this couple of uh, siblings are children of a mortal woman. Which means from the mortality of nature. Midgard. But Valkyria is from superior. From Asgard. Do you get that? How beautiful is everything showing there? And of course it's more. But you have to enjoy watching it. You have questions. Silence, 
Somebody questioning there, some question there in the, yeah? The sword is called nothing. What does that mean? Well, it means that every time that somebody awakes the Kundalini, the energy, something new. That is nothing. This is the sword, is it? Why is the sword called nothing or nothing? Nothing. Well, is what is coming from your hard work, right? Because the sword has many meanings, but really nothing could be also nothing, right? Just coming, of course, something new that is not physical, something that is not rec- recognizable, something because the sword, when you acquire the sword the first time, is something new that's called nothing. A power that is giving you that you never had. And that's why it's nothing. Right? Because it's something new. And if you fall and you rise again, nothing appears again. But it is not that nothing that you had before. It's another nothing. Be with right, view? right view, of course. Mm-hmm. Nothingness. The right way in which the energy of the sword gives you... A, when you work in yourself, alchemically speaking, you have to utilize the sword in order to defeat your enemies. Every time that you kill an enemy with the power of the sword, which is the Kundalini, your Divine Mother, a new view, internal view appears inside of you, which is nothing. Nothing related with this physical world. That's why in Buddhism it's a stated... That the being doesn't exist. It's true. When the being appears, it's something new. And comes from nothing. The, the, with the fire. From the fire. The being is nothing in relation to what we think. Many people think about God in different ways. Have beautiful ideas, concepts about God. But God, God has nothing to do with it. God is nothing related with what we know. And that's why that sword is the one that kills all of those that are not related with nothing, but with something. Something mechanical. Well, if questions arise Later, you can uh, write there in the forum and we will answer them. But we uh, invite you to study this lecture and to watch this Valkyria, beautiful opera, in which everything that you see here is hidden. There are more, but some things you need question in order for, for that knowledge to come out. And uh, thank you very much. And we will see you and hear you next Saturday with Siegfried, the hero. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of 10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.